Well, hello again, everyone. Dr. Jim Hoven here, your host of the Ramos Law Difference Makers podcast, where I have the unique opportunity, joy, and really cool assignment, actually, to visit with people every single week who are making a difference in one way or another. And that difference can be locally at the city level, or it could be at the state level. Even some national and international folks have been on the show. And so today, I have a great honor, great pleasure to visit with someone who is basically doing stuff near and dear to my heart, and that's healthcare. With me having background as a chiropractor, um, being able to talk to a provider, a DO, a guy who understands me, who gets me, this is going to be really fun. So um, hang on. You're probably going to get some more questions on this, but we're going to have a great day today with our special guest, Dr. Mike Tracy. Dr. Mike, thanks for coming on and being on the show. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Absolutely. So this is a, a really cool episode. We're going to have fun here because we get to talk as we're kind of cousin providers, right? Because yeah. the, the history of of DOs is really interesting compared to the history of, of DCs. Yeah. And so you guys took a really awesome path where and and got integrated with the medical profession. So you can, you have this whole range of things that you can do, whereas the, the chiropractors kept the manipulation as the, the really foundational piece and then stayed more on the, I don't know, uh, we'll call it allopathic or complementary and alternative medicine side. So we have this fundamental connection of manipulation, the nervous system and the circulatory system. And that's kind of a cool, cool thing. But what you've done and where you've taken is absolutely fantastic. Can you tell our audience just a little bit about yourself, um, who you are, where you grew up, just a little bit background stuff? Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm a Colorado native. I grew up in Littleton and then went off to <clears throat> school in California. I went to the University of Southern California for my undergrad and graduate school degrees. I studied gerontology um, at USC. So now explain that to people. They might not know so what that gerontology is, is. That's the study of aging. So I started out as a biology major and I thought it was really boring and there were four or 500 people in my classes. And I figured if I stay on this path, I'm not going to make it to med school because I'm not engaged in the learning. So USC has the only college of gerontology in the, in the nation. There's gerontology programs, but they actually were their own like special university. I did not know that. College within the university. So, um, once I, once I went on that path, I, I took, I thought some really interesting classes on medical ethics and death and dying and, and just the biopsychosocial model of how we age in this country. Um, and so it's been a very interesting, uh, evolution. Um, I, I originally, <clears throat> when I, when I wanted to go to medical school, I, I thought about being a geriatrician, taking care of old folks. I've always really enjoyed working with seniors and then I discovered as, <clears throat> as I was doing my rotations in, in medical school to uh, the field of physiatry, which in and of itself, I think is pretty fascinating. So my physiatry is the, the treatment of pain, right? Like we're working on a lot of pain management, that sort of that's thing. That's a piece of the puzzle, but it's, it's a little broader than that. So it's, it's patients that have been injured or disabled in some way, and it's, it's teaching these folks how to learn to live with their new disability. So think of a traumatic brain injury or a spinal cord injury or a stroke um, or rehabilitation after a joint replacement, um, congenital issues, um, birth traumas like cerebral palsy. You know, we do Botox for those folks. So it's, it's a really broad topic um, and, and specialty. And then, you know, f now being in practice for 14 years, um, my focus is more on outpatient care of folks that have been in car accidents, folks that deal with chronic pain, um, weekend warriors that hurt themselves, um, and just trying to keep people, you know, functioning and moving forward with their lives. Nice. I want to explore that deeper, but first I yeah. want to go back to understanding what got you to that place before you went to USC, when you were in high school doing your training, did you know you wanted to go into the health sciences, into the healing professions? Uh, where, where were you at? What was your thinking at that process? I think I've, I knew I wanted to be a doctor since about fifth or sixth grade. Um, Doctors in your family or? No, my mom was a office manager for a gynecologist. Um, so I, I worked there in high school, which was an interesting place to work with uh, a 14, 15 year old kid and, and you know, 17 women <laughs> mothering me and giving me advice along the way. Um, so I um, just it was just always something I thought I wanted to do. 
And so were your parents really like, yeah, go do it. Go, go chase that dream. Or did they say, man, there, there's a lot to this thing that you better no, they were, think they were it. very encouraging. Uh, my mom's boss said, do anything but healthcare. Um, and I ignored him and I'm glad I did. But, mm-hmm. um, I, I think everyone just has a different path. Medicine keeps changing and, um, you just have to keep evolving with it if you want to, if you want to stay fresh, I guess. Right. So you went to college, you went to USC with the thought in mind of end up going to medical school, going to medical school. I applied right after, right as I was graduating, took the MCAT twice, you know, trying to get a better score, got the same score both times. And, you know, you're set up in the world when you go to college that anything is possible. And then, you know, I think I applied to 18 or 19 medical schools and I got zero interviews and I got no I got rejected from all the schools the first year. So I was like, oh, crap. Now what am I going to do? Yeah. Um, so I went to graduate school, got a master's in gerontology. And how, how long was graduate training after your degree? It was just a year. So, so you went to a year, got your master's. So I was able to you know, get a master's degree. I was able to start my teaching career. So I worked as a teaching assistant for an intro level class. Um, and I learned that you know I really enjoyed teaching as well. So that's always kind of carried with me and been a part of of what I like to do as a practicing physician. Mm -hmm. And so when you, I want to explore just for a minute, the science, emotion, and practicality of rejection. Because as we know, rejection is a very visceral thing that if you've not been practicing rejected, getting rejected in little steps, if you get a big rejection, it can easily derail you from your dream. So you said 18 times you got no's. How did you deal with that? What were your tools, your, especially at such a young age? Well, it, it was tough because, you know, you, you go to the mailbox and you see the small envelope and that's never good. So um, I actually, I still have a file with all my rejection letters in, in a file cabinet somewhere just to remind myself that no doesn't mean no. It means that you can keep pushing on, reevaluate the situation and dust yourself off and try again. And so... When I applied the second time, I looked back and I had applied to, you know, 17 schools all over the country, but they were all MD schools. And I had known an osteopath growing up. Um, My mom uh, went to see him for an adjustment one time, and I just found him to be very interesting. And so I looked into osteopathy. And the second time I applied, I applied to seven DO schools and seven MD schools because it sounded like something that I would be interested in, the, the holistic approach to taking care of a patient. I was interested in learning about manipulation um, and applied the second time and I got 14 more rejections. So now I'm twice rejected. My MCATs are good for one more year and I'm like, I'm, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to do this. And, yeah. and what the hell am I gonna do because this is not in my plan. And so I moved home from California, finished, and I, st- I took a job at an assisted living facility. And so at 24, I was, in, I was the resident services director for 112 people in an assisted living in downtown Littleton. And I was in charge of the people that clean their room and do their laundry and provide their personal care. And the person that hired me said, I, you have absolutely no experience, but I love that you have this gerontology background. And I think you'll bring some fresh energy to this place. And boy, was I in over my head. You know, I, I sure <laughs> thought I knew a lot about, you know, managing people and, and interacting, but the academic me did not uh, really, wasn't really prepared for the supervisor me. Um, and, and trying to keep 112 people happy, trying to keep staff doing, dealing with turnover. I mean, people would call out and I'd be doing laundry, you know, for 50 <laughs> people and you know, I'd be stuck on the overnight shift because the person called out and we didn't have anybody else. And I was always just kind of raised that you just step up and, and get the work Do done. Do what needs to be done. So, um, so I applied the third time. And the third time I applied, I applied to the University of Colorado and all the rest were DO schools. But by that time, my master's degree had been completed. They had those grades and transcripts and the big envelopes started coming in. So I finally got my first interview, and then I, I, I got other interviews. I got interviewed at CU, and I was told, well, your, your MCAT scores are not 
not good enough for this school. You, you, based on getting a 29 and you really need a 30 or above, you're, you would struggle here. And so I got waitlisted and I ended up getting accepted to the um, Western University College of Osteopathic Medicine in Pomona, California. And I matriculated there. You know, I was bummed that it was a pricey private school, but um, it was the best thing that ever happened because I was meant to be a DO. I was yes. meant to work with my hands. I was meant to treat people. Um, you know, one of the tenets of osteopathic medicine is the body has the ability to heal itself. And I know that's also kind of a chiropractic um, mantra as well. Um, and the more I learned about manipulation, the more I liked it. I became a teaching assistant. I then applied for a fellowship where I got to teach medical school and teach the manipulation course. And that's just always been a big part of it. So now I mentor students from Rocky Vista and Parker. It's the DO school here in Colorado. And it's, it's fun to show people how to use this stuff on real patients. So how do you take and blend? This was an interesting thing that we did in the chiropractic world. We didn't have the opportunity for prescription medicines to, to prescribe them. We didn't have the opportunity to do any kind of surgery, minor, major sutures. And even today in most virtually every state, chiropractors can work on the skin and even do acupuncture needles, but we can't put anything into or underneath the skin in the way of a needle injection. You know, right. we can't insert things, even vitamins. As you were going through that, you wanted to go to medical school. You end up at this DO school. You're seeing this love for manipulation, how the body can heal itself and balance and structure and motion. But then there's this other side with the medicines. Was it confusing, refreshing for you to be able to see, wait, I can use pharmacology or molecules to help with supplements, to help with movement. What did that do for your psyche as a healer? I think, you know, having a, it's just a bigger toolbox. You know, people didn't really understand what, what's an osteopath? What's it, what's a DO? And it said, it's an MD who knows how to do manipulation. We have all the training that an MD has. Plus we have an additional three to 400 hours of manipulation training. There's a medical school in Michigan, Michigan State, and they, they have a DO school and an MD school at this university. And they all go to the same classes, but on Tuesday mornings, the DOs go to manipulation class at 8 o'clock and the MD students show up at 10 o'clock. Otherwise, their curriculum's identical. So to me, that's, that's fascinating. And I, I've had MD colleagues that were you know kind of jealous of our training. Like, I, I wish I had learned how to do that or I wish that was in my skill set. Did you find that you, as you were, especially as you became more of a specialist moving into physiatry where the cases get deeper and more complex. And like you described earlier, it's not just pain management. It's the management of all kinds of injuries, whether it be stroke or some of these birth issues, all these things. Did you find that you were using more or less of your complementary medicine as it, as it got higher up the scale of let's call it severity? So I, I had to really fight to keep my skills up. Um, I think manipulation is a technical skill. If you don't use it, you lose it. We all get trained and we're all really pretty good with our hands by the end of our second year of medical school. But then you go out on rotations and you know, you're doing pediatrics or you're doing surgery or gynecology and opportunities to do manipulation really have to be sold to the preceptors because most of them are, are allopathic MDs. So if, if they trust you and if, if they want this for their patients, um, I was usually pretty persuasive. I think it helped cause I was, a you know, I taught the class, so they didn't think I was going to screw up their, their patients. But you know, in, in my residency, which I, I trained at Northwestern in Chicago, you know, my program director was a DO and I thought, oh my God, finally somebody's going to understand. <laughs> yeah. And so I still found it very difficult to work on patients. Um, so I would work on my coworkers and the staff and, you know, he'd walk by and see me doing an adjustment on somebody's neck or back. And he'd kind of shake his head and go, you're going to, you're, you're not being properly supervised. And I said, you're standing <laughs> right there. And he said, I don't know how to do that stuff. Wow. Um, and so I think just, you know, being able to, to take a migraine headache away from a coworker who's, you know, six hours into a 12 hour shift or, um, you know, your your residents on call and they're starting to get a cold and you do a lymphatic drainage treatment and try to get their immune system pumped up to help them i mean and then of course it's you know you come home for holidays and the family has uh, decided there's a 24 person waiting list for yes. your for your home clinic so that's exactly right i see that every holiday 
So I was, you know, probably for the first six or seven years, Christmas Eve was, was a working night for me. Um, but now I've kind of set the limits like, you know, I have an office now. You can come see me there. That's fun. Yeah. So um, moving back to the all your geriatric experience for a minute, when you were taking the courses at USC, was that more about how we age as humans and the natural cycle of aging? Or was there a longevity component to how to overcome aging? Because now we got, you know, David Sinclair is huge in this uh, in this process. And he's, you know, a professor at Harvard and doing that whole thing on you know, using molecules and using the body systems on these longevity pathways and, you know, this and that in, in a geri in a geriology, a geriatric, geriatric program, geriatric, yeah. geriatric program. Is there going to be a lot of longevity medicine or is it more how we age in general? Um, well, there's the ideal, which is, you know, how, how we successfully age. And then there's the realistic way of, you know, unfortunately in, in the medical model, we're still a very reactive society. We, we, we react to you're having joint degeneration. We react to, you know, neurodegeneration. You, 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 you've now developed Parkinson's, you've now developed Alzheimer's, you've now developed, you know, severe arthritis. And it's, and it's not based on a preventative model where it, it really should. And so everything that kind of, we were trained to do was more, this is the problem we have to react to it instead of, you know, these problems can actually be prevented with the right steps. And I think our system has a long way to go to get to that point. Yes. And have you stayed connected to that community of folks within your specialty of physiatry? Do you still have a lot of the connection into the geriatric population? Um, I, I have, uh, I mean, I, what I like about my, my office is I have patients that probably are as young as seven or eight and I have a patient that's 95 and everybody in between. So it allows me to kind of have a, a broad spectrum. Um, but just, you know, like taking, taking someone who's not sleeping when you don't sleep, that affects everything in your life. It makes your pain worse. It makes your mood worse. Um, and so being able to address the whole person and not just their body part, I think is one of the things I like most about what I do. That is so cool. I, you know, when I was practicing, you know, before doing the stuff I'm doing with the law firm and the other things at this point, I really enjoyed, I found that I got to the point as a provider and, and I'll share where this question is going in a minute. I got to a provider. I didn't want the weird and wonderful cases. What I really loved is the straight ahead musculoskeletal stuff, the low back, you know, not the real complicated low back that had all these neurological or fibromyalgic components. I wanted the basic stuff because I wanted to get the people to where they were at maintenance care. I had a practice full of people that would come in once a month, once every six weeks, whatever. And, and you know, I'd see four generations of a family all at one time and hugging and adjusting and doing all that stuff. And then helping athletes. I, my specialty was in sports injuries. So sports injuries and musculoskeletal pain, those were my sweet spots, right? I didn't want to get deep into the blood work and the functional medicine. Have you found as a provider that you have your just your ideal day, your ideal patient where they, they fill your cup regardless of what's going on with them. And what does that look like? So for me, I, I like when patients get better. I think there's two aspects to what I do. There's the chronic care of patients that are, are not going to get better. You know, that's the amputee that's not, their legs not going to ever regenerate. So how do you learn to live with the prosthesis you have and, and how do you, how do you succeed? How do you get back to work? Um, and I think the, the other patients are, you know, I, I think of this one family that, you know, they'll just pop on my schedule every couple months. And it's this, this kid I've known now since he was in middle school and now he's a junior, he's taller than I am and he plays basketball. And every now and then he gets a psoas spasm and he throws his back out and he knows exactly what's wrong. And he, now he drives himself to see me without his mom and you know, he, he's like, I, you know, I, I need you to adjust my hips. And so adjust his hips, send him on his way and I'll see him next time. So sending people out of the office feeling better instead of here's a prescription or here's a physical therapy regimen I want you to do. It's, it's really powerful to send people who came into your office feeling poorly out, feeling better. That is so cool. And the, again, I cannot overstate this when, and you met my son, my son, when he was looking yeah. at healthcare, came up and visited with you, said nothing but the highest praise for you because I had told him, 
when I was in, you know, when I was going through and he was trying to figure out what to do. Yeah. And, you know, I'm like, look, Connor, not every um, chiropractor has the life that we live and has enjoyed the success that we've enjoyed. Like we've been really blessed and really fortunate for chiropractic. You know, there's, it's a beautiful medicine. There's an art to it, but it's a very specific niche for a personality that's able to do well at it because it's a business. It's a hustle. It's a business. And I told him if I had my choice, I think DO would be the way to go because of everything that you've shared, Dr. Mike, like you could do the complementive care, you could do the medical care, you can do surgery, you can do anything you want. And, and just the veil is lifted and to hear you being able to take that magic of someone and that you get to decide, okay, when, when is it, let the body heal itself. When is it assist the body with some sort of a molecule that might get it done faster or allow you to do more complementary stuff or in physical therapy, that must be just such a great feeling for you. It is. And I think I like not having the limits placed on me. When I, when I was finishing my, my training, we didn't, we still didn't have equal practice rights in all 50 states in, in 20. Between uh, DOs and MDs? Yeah. Okay. New Orleans or Louisiana was the last holdout. And finally, now we have equal practice rights in all 50 states, but you know, it's been an evolutionary process. And I think just having people, you know, look, look at you differently. You know, I'm hoping that as we continue to have more DOs educated and more DO schools open that people just recognize that it's better. I mean, I love hearing patients say, you know, I prefer my doctors to be DOs because I think they treat me differently. Wow. What an honor. Yeah, that's great. That is great. Well, tell me, let's talk a little bit about business now, just for a second. Okay. <clears throat> we have a lot of people that listen to the show that are entrepreneurs and business folks. As a doctor, this is one thing that I struggled with as I was coming up. I had an office full of people, but my thought was, Healthcare should be a right, not a privilege. And so we're not, if, if you don't have the money, you come in here anyway, we'll figure something out. Well, what I did was fill my schedule up with 60 to 80 people a day. And I was still struggling to pay some of my bills because I had high student loans and all the rest of it. As you've been going through this now, I mean, getting super highly trained, super specialized, teaching all the things that you've done. What was been your biggest business challenge or business lesson that you might share with someone who maybe isn't even in healthcare, but is considering business? Uh, I think, well, right now, I mean, I think it's, it's hard to find people that, that can work, uh, in your office that the salary demands have gone up so quickly and the, the talent pool and just the people that, that want to do this work, I think it's hard to find people. And so we're getting more creative. Like how can we, how can we be a, a place that people want to work? I think making it not just, you know, you're here to earn your paycheck, but you're here to be part of this family. And we, we work together to take care of these folks. It's right. not just me and you're the underling getting the authorizations from the insurance companies. We as a team are going to, going to help make these people feel better. Yeah. You're carrying out a vision and a mission. You're, you're bringing them into your vision and mission, but getting someone to buy into that. Yeah. And how you do know, you do it? So we've, we've kind of changed our approach to, instead of people that, you know, are, have just been in healthcare for their whole lives, taking risks on people that have no experience, fresh out of, you know, undergrad or grad school, people that have, um, desires to have careers in healthcare, I want to be a PA. I want to go to medical school. I want to go get my, my master's in health administration. All right, well, let's, let's work here for a couple of years and get some experience and, and make sure that's something you want to do. You can kind of test drive the medical profession and make sure it's right for you. And I think that's a really high honor too, is to have somebody come work with me and then matriculate and go on yes. to med school. Do you think you just brought up a great point to me because you had mentioned it and I, I wanted to bring it back a little bit ago. Yeah. You talked about when you got your first set of rejection letters, then you got your second set and you're like, oh my gosh, I only got one more year on these MCAT results. Yeah. And so then you went to work and you put your degree and your master's to work in this facility. Was Do you think that made the difference? So for anyone looking to go into a healthcare thing, this, this getting into the participation participatory phase of it, as opposed to just the academic phase. Was that the, the key decider? I think, um, it was really good training. It was really good experience to have people that depended on you and looked to you for leadership and direction. 
Um, I didn't know it at the time, but as a pre-med student, I didn't take a business class. I right. didn't take a marketing class. I didn't take an accounting class, which is a mistake. I think that that should be part of our curriculum because medicine is a business just as much as it's a healing science. And so unless we're all just going to go be employees for a big healthcare system like UC Health or SCL or one of these other endeavors where you're just a cog in the wheel, you know, I want to be part of, of the process of making something patient centered. And I think that's kind of where we're, we're headed in the wrong direction in healthcare is that everything's about profits and about corporate organization. And when's the last time a patient, you know, felt like they went to their doctor, their doctor was listening instead of typing on their computer with their back to the patient. Okay. Now what else is your problem? What else do you need? Here's your prescriptions. Here's your inhaler. Here's your antibiotics. And it's just very impersonal. At least that's my experience when I go see my doctor. Mm. And you know, you bring up a great point there. The, what is the role of the provider in the patient's life? I think what you just painted for us would be ideally we know our patients, they know us, and we, we see generations of them, two, three, four generations, because we get them and they get us. And there's a connection. What role do you think that, do you think that our health care facilities should play in a community? In other words, we've got these big conglomerates. Are they, are they giving back to the community? Maybe they're donating money, maybe they're not, but do they get involved or, or should they, should they be part of the healing at the level outside the office four walls? Well, again, if, you, if you're looking at healthcare as a right versus a privilege, if it's a privilege system and, and it's the, if the, you have the money or you have the insurance or the resources to pay for the care, then you'll have good access. Well, I, I don't agree with that. I think that everybody should have the access to care and, and to continuity where they get to see the same person and they get to build a relationship. And a lot of my patients I've had for 10 years, I know about their their kids and their grandkids and their vacations and their home lives. And, and that some people, you know, their outlet is when they come see me and just spending that time. And, and it's not just about a physical exam and, and writing a prescription. It's really about a connection and making their, you know, their next month or their next journey, you know, a success and giving them, um, the motivation to keep going. I agree with that a thousand percent. And, and for us, I know we work with a, through the law firm here, we work with a group called stride community health centers, and there's 18 of them. And it paints the picture exactly what you're saying, where if you have great insurance, great, we'll take care of you. If you have no insurance, great. We're going to take care of you. They do not turn patients away on their, based on their ability to pay. And so we are big into that system. I'm on one of their boards there for uh, fundraising and this and that. And it just seems to me that if we can have that compassionate human interest in each other, then we're going to have a, a, an impact outside of the four walls. So we're doing what we do to make them feel better. But man, healing is a multi-level thing, right? Like it's the physical, like you said, it's what that physical has to do with mechanical or chemical. In other words, if we're touching them and adjusting them and doing soft tissue work and rehab, or we're giving them medicines, but there's also mental, emotional, spiritual, and that comes in support and in different ways. And to know that people have a place to go, like what you're talking about and what you're creating, generationally speaking, I think it's special. How did you develop that? Is that just in your DNA and your heart, or did you intentionally plan that kind of a practice? I think it's genetic. I think it comes from my mother who... Um, always has a lending hand, always has a kind word and always has somebody who needs her help and she readily gives it, you know, and I, I, I just think I've watched that my whole life and it seems like a good way to, to live your life <laughs> it uh, and it's worked so far. It does. It does. How much do you guys do in lifestyle uh, education in your practice? Not as much as we'd like because mm. it's not something that insurance companies pay for. Yep. Um, and so, you know, I will, I can, it's, it's really talking with patients about what direction they want to go in. And, um, we don't do as much as, as I think we could or should. Mm. Um, you know, I've toyed with the idea of going back and studying regenerative medicine and functional medicine, because I think that also would be very complementary to my training as a DO and my training as a PM and R doctor. But, it's just like, well, I only have 24 hours in a day. Do I really want to come home and study and get board certified in another specialty? Um, 
but I'm only 14 years into this leg of my career. And I look at someone like you that's had three or four different directions you've gone in. And I'm, you know, I wonder sometimes if I'm ready to to take a different direction. You know, that's such an interesting path. And I want to explore that for a while. Cause I, sure. I will tell you when I first got into practice, man, Mike, here was my deal. I am going to literally, the last thing I'm going to do on the planet is I'm going to be given adjustment. And then my time here will be done. The patient will walk out feeling better. And I'm going to drop dead. Like that's how it was in my mind at 24 years old when I graduated. Yeah. Right. And it remained that way for a long time. And then as skills and things started changing and opportunities started coming, I thought, I want to explore something different. And what really was hard for me is the day that I had decided to move out of active healthcare full-time, because as you know, the patients start saying, wait, what am I going to do without you? you. And, yeah. and I was really trying to reassure them that the doctors we had brought in, they were well-trained, they were ready to go. They were going to take care of them, but there is that bond, that connection that gets created. And I have found that if I'm really keeping my heart open, the next best thing, it just kind of shows itself to me as long as I do my work. You know, I got to do my part. And so as you're saying, you know, where could your practice go? I think that's a great lesson for anyone listening is, you know, you don't have to end up where you think that you're going to end up. You just got to keep doing the best work you can every day. Well, and I think, you know, the pandemic, uh, we were talking before the show, uh, you know, there seems like life before the pandemic and then there was Tiger King and then it just <laughs> seems like now we're, we're coming out of it, I guess, and learning to be social again, learning how to have a conversation without a mask on. I mean, all these things that we just had to do because that's what society demanded and that's what this healthcare put us in. But surviving through that and, you know, at one point learning how to do a telemedicine visit and how do you examine somebody over a computer screen? How do you get an 88-year-old to log in on their computer with a camera and how do you deliver their healthcare? Well, it's tough and it's not user-friendly and, and we weren't ready for that. But again... Failure wasn't an option. Like yes. we're going to stay open. We're going to keep people employed. We're going to keep people safe. You know, we're going to give each person a room to work out of, and we're just going to change the way we do things. And you know, it was kind of like, okay, on a Thursday we're going to shut down, uh, but we still have patients that need to be seen. So we're going to try to work remotely from home, which I hated. I hate working from home. Like uh, even if I did televisits the whole day, I wanted to sit in my office because. I wanted to be around my coworkers. Yes. And I you. wanted to have that interaction, even if it was just 10 minutes, because I, I'm an extrovert and it was really awkward and painful to be stuck inside isolated. And so at least I had that control. I'm like, nope, everyone's going to come in, pick your room, pick your corner, whatever you want to do. We are not going to get sick and we are not going to shut this office down and we're not going to stop doing what we did. And and we, we made it through that. So it's like, all right, well, we, we're coming out of this. Now what? Now what are we going to do? What next? Yeah. And, and I don't know. What, what, did you, what did you learn as, um, as a provider about your patients coming through something like this? Because we've had people that do emotional work on, on the show. We've had people that own business on the show. And it's always fascinating when this topic comes up, and it invariably does, sure. about the, the pandemic and what it's meant. Did you notice any kind of difference in the conditions you were seeing, the severity of them, the, uh, emotional layering on top of uh, social isolation. Did you notice anything different among the same patient population that you were treating? So a lot more depression, a lot more sleep issues, insomnia, worry about bills or health. Um, you know, that especially that first year before the vaccines came out, people were just like, when are we gonna, when, is, when are things gonna get better? you know, healthcare workers, nurse managers, you know, healthcare workers, I think were probably the hardest people to watch because they just day in and day out, they had to work in the ICU and work on these patients. And there was just, you know, it was either you're going to circle the drain and die, or you're going to, you're going to recover. And we don't even know how to fix this or treat this. Yes. It's just, and, and just knowing, I, knowing that you had all that pressure and all of that that sadness to kind of hang over you. I, I think that was when I was really glad I was an outpatient doc, because if I had been in a hospital, I probably would have burned out like most of the other folks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now they're still suffering from that, right? There's a, they there's are. a shortage of trying to find qualified folks because people either, like you say, burned out or they want rural stuff. They want out of something. They don't want to be mandated to get a vaccine. There's a lot of reasons that they're out, but yeah. it's now put a, a, another burden on our system. Yeah. So, you know, when you have your car accident or when you have your heart attack or stroke, 
there's not going to be anyone there because they don't want to do it anymore. The system just kind of gobbled up the resources and the energy that the people had. And we're, we're just now seeing like that being addressed. And, and I, I don't know, I don't know how, how you're going to stay motivated and to, to do that. Right. I know they were calling for docs at one point to come in and, you know, from outside docs to try to come in and give relief and rest to the doctors and the nurses and the providers. I fully expected to be drafted, you know, and I was like, well, what are my PM and R skills? I'm really not good with ICU and ventilators. My partner's an anesthesiologist in my clinic, so he'd probably do great with that stuff. You know, maybe I'll be good for the patients that are on the floor to help triage the ones that are recovering and get them stronger and get them back home. I mean, I was fully prepared to, you know, do what, what the community needed me to do. And that, and that never happened. And maybe it should have, Mm. because then we would have had maybe more buy-in like, look, we're all in this together. Yeah. You know, let's roll up our sleeves as Americans and, and let's tackle this challenge and we'll see. Wow. And so now, now looking past it, assuming we're maybe at some kind of a a sunset on this thing, we're certainly not out of the woods and there's always the rumor or the what's going on in another country and it's going to come over here. And I know that's going on even as we speak here sure. at the, uh, towards the end of March in 2022. Um, how do you, do you see medicine different now as a whole, or is it everything like kind of segmented? Like you've got your patient population and these things just are going to happen or how, how do you now see it based on your perspective? I'm just seeing it as like, okay, today's Thursday. Let's, let's just kind of get through today and get through next week and, and get through next month. And I don't, I don't, I don't, I haven't really had time to reflect on it. I think it's something that should be done at some point because it's just getting harder. I'm, I'm in, I feel like I'm an endangered species. I'm like a a clinic that is privately owned, privately managed, not corporatized. And the patient is my focus. And I, I think those are becoming less common. Yeah. And it's like, how long, how long can I do this? Or, you know, how, how long until I'm, I'm squeezed out. And I, and I, and that's kind of what has been on my mind. And I don't know. What, what do you think about that? That brings up such a great topic. We have this corporatization of medicine. And again, it's really in your world, in the chiropractic profession, you haven't seen that big guy buying little guy, unless it's a little bigger chiropractor buying a little smaller chiropractor. We haven't seen the likes of SCL health come in and sweep up a bunch of chiropractic clinics. Why do they do that? And, and what's the attractor for all of the smaller practices to go in? Is it expense or why, why do they do that? I mean, I had a conversation a couple of weeks ago with a surgeon. Um, he's been in private practice as long as I have. And, and we were almost just kind of having sharing war stories. And he said, you know, it's so hard to just do your job and, and that's already enough and it's already enough of a challenge, but hearing that people want to be paid more, hearing that they don't like this coworker and all the drama of employing and, and running three offices, uh, which is what he did. I only went one run off one. I only run one office and that's more than enough. But, <laughs> but you know, he said, I'm just going to go work for a hospital. I'm going to, I'm going to let them handle the HR stuff and I'm just going to be a surgeon. And it's almost like a resignation. Like I'm, I'm 40 years old now and I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to scrap anymore. I just want to go to work and I want to come home. And, and I think that's going to, I think that's going to be a detriment to the patient population because you're going to have people that are less engaged and you're going to have people that are less likely to advocate for their patient because, Hey man, I'm just a shift employee at this yes, point. Yes. And I worry about that. But you know, I also like you and my student loans still aren't paid off. And, um, I, I still have, you know, a life outside of medicine that I want to maintain. And I don't want to, I don't want to be, you know, working my last shift and then dropping dead of a, of a heart attack because I'm trying to, to keep the scraps together. Right. And I think, I think we have to, we have to figure that out. And I think that probably has to come from a community level because I don't think the city level, the state level, the federal level, I don't think, I don't think that's in the, the plan. So I think you have to dig into your communities and, and get established, you know, where you're at and be part of, of who those folks are in the community. And, and that's, you know, maybe, maybe the solution. Yeah. I know we I'm, talked about that earlier, right? Like yeah. what, what happens outside the four walls of the clinic and, and I have never heard it put in that perspective, Dr. Mike, but I think 
you are right. If I'm opening a practice today, and again, you know, I've moved through that place where I adjust, you know, we have 70 employees here at the firm and I've adjusted the vast majority of them, you know, several times and have a, a table in my office. And so my community is my friends, family, and my team here. But if I were starting a practice right now that was going to be private practice, it would be all about either a concierge medicine thing and understanding where I had at least a base of that, where people take their health serious. And that's why we take their health seriously because they're not part of the machine and they want to be treated separately. Like that would be a big focus, I think, of mine if I were starting practice. And that's what I hear you say. Well, I'd much rather talk to the patient about what they need instead of meet the insurance company's requirements to get paid for the visit. Yes. And I feel like what we've evolved into, even from 10 years ago, is I spend so much time trying to get the boxes checked to get paid that I'm focused more sometimes on the paperwork than the person. Mm-hmm. And that's that's a big shock for when you come out of this because we come out bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. I'm just here to help take care of people. And then the reality hits of, don't forget the paperwork. Yes, and there's a stack of it. A stack of it. And it's, you know, it's work through lunch. It's work, you know, f- an hour after you see your last patient just to get all the the I's dotted and the T's crossed because at the end of the day, I'm, I'm really ineffective if I can't pay my bills and keep my doors open. And you can't help anybody else either. Right. Right. And so, you know, I think <clears throat> as we start down that road, I feel like what we've talked about the last five to 10 minutes is probably eye-opening for a lot of people if they're listening, if, they've, if they don't know someone who's a provider yeah. and, or they're not a provider themselves, they, they think that providers have the world by the tail. You're a doctor, you're a nurse, you're a PA, NP, chiropractor, physical therapist. Man, you just got all these patients coming in. But there is a lot of trauma, whether it's a thing called compassion fatigue, yeah. which we see here in the law firm, you see these same traumas over and over, and all of a sudden it starts draining your life soul, your life energy, or whether it's the business that you're having to run, or whether it's the all the stress of managing employees, or all com- combined. I know as providers, there's a lot of issues with um, drug dependency, divorce, even suicide in, in some of these different locales and pockets and specialties. Being a doctor, being a provider is not easy because you give, 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 and it seems like the monetary reward should be enough. And sometimes that's not even where we want to be. That goes down every year as these sure. contracts change. But the soul um, refilling, it can be hard when you're giving. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I, I got married a couple of years ago and I, I took three weeks off for, for my honeymoon and I was super guilty about that. Like I felt awful about being away from my patients and my office for that long. But what a amazing break and I don't know why I didn't do it sooner I don't know why I limit myself to you know four days off in a row as as all I can have like I'm I'm my own boss like I I don't have anyone telling me I can't do this it's more like the obligation of why I I really shouldn't it's like well I I think I should and Mm -hmm. I think I think learning self-care I think has come from the pandemic and and I can't take care of people effectively if I'm not taking care of myself. And they don't teach self-care in medical school or residency either. Um, and that's hopefully something that's changing because we have to take care of ourselves so we can be effective healthcare providers. So true. <clears throat> Dr. Mike, tell us a little bit about your company, Integrated Sports and Spine. What do you do? Who do you focus on? What are the, the things that you provide to patients? So uh, we have two PAs. I have an anesthesiologist that's an interventional pain specialist and myself. So we each kind of bring different skills to the table. Um, We treat, I tend to see the more complicated patients. So um, not the simple back pain or the pinched nerve in your neck. It's, it's, you know, the, the fibro patient with a lupus flare or it's the double amputee um, whose, whose legs aren't fitting because you can't, get the swelling done or it's a spinal cord injury patient that you know is is learning how to walk again and and they're having a lot of pain because their muscles are weak and so i i think taking complicated patients um taking simple patients so one of the types of people i like to take care of are people that have been injured uh in a car accident uh which is how i got to meet you right um 
these people were hurt. They didn't expect it. Uh, they're sidelined. They're not able to work. They're not able to sleep. They're in a, a bad mood because they're uncomfortable. Their car's totaled. Nobody can find a, a new car to buy because there's no cars available. Like it's, it's this whole big process. And so, you know, it's like taking the junk drawer out of your kitchen and dumping it on the floor and now they got to put it back together. And so I think just giving direction and guidance through that process, um, and, and having people like literally graduate from my clinic, like you don't need me anymore. I think that's one of the things that we're really good at. Um, we have an injection suite in our office so we can do epidurals and we can do, um, facet blocks and joint injections in our office. And so that became really important during the pandemic because governor Polish shut down all elective surgery centers. So people with injuries and back pain didn't stop because of the pandemic, but right. we also, so we were able to keep going and keep, keep people out of the ERs. Cause that was a really dangerous place to be. Um, I also do a study called an EMG where I can study the peripheral nerves in your arms or legs to figure out if there's nerve damage, if so, where is it? And if so, how bad is it? And, and then that can direct treatment, whether it's surgical decompression or whether it's, it's physical therapy. So we try to define the problem and then come up with a solution to treat it. And so as an outpatient rehab doc, I would say I'm kind of like a mechanic for the human body. Um, and you know, I don't, I'm not going to look at your, your kidney function and your heart and lungs. I'm going to look at your musculoskeletal system and your nervous system. And we're going to try to make heads and tails of, of what your body needs to get back on track. I love that so much. Yeah. <clears throat> well, I'll tell you, this has been a fascinating episode for me. And again, I could talk with you forever on these kind of things. I want to ask you this question. Um, as you've come up, you've faced massive rejection. Yeah. You've faced massive adversity. You've had incredible support from your parents. You've done amazing things. Is there one piece of advice that either you've given or you've learned along the way that you would now consider a cornerstone piece of how you operate your operating system that you'd want to share with us? Um, I think for me, transparency is probably the best thing um, for your staff, for your coworkers, for your partners in business and, and for your patients. You know, it, it's very hard when you're having a bad day to pretend you're not. So I don't. Um, but it also means on a good day, I'm not going to, I'm going to share that too. Um, being honest with people, with your expectations of what you want from somebody, but also having them have the mutual feedback loop where they can speak their mind too and not be worry about retribution or worry about, you know, the judgment that may come from their statement or their feelings. And I think that's just part of why I like my office because I like, I like knowing about your life outside the office. It's, we don't just spend, you know, 40 hours a week together. I want to know what you do when you're not here. And, and I want to know your, your spouses and your significant others. And, um, I don't expect us to hang out all the time outside of work, but having a genuine interest in, in people and knowing their families and their children, um, I think makes it a more, um, habitable place to work. Mm, just, so good. just having that connection Yeah, and, and, and meaning it not, you know, I, I really, I'm really interested in you just had another grandchild. How many is that now? Like things like that. I just think, um, that's, that's what garners loyalty. And I think loyalty is what helps drive success. That is beautiful. Well, you have obviously done a great job making a success of your patient care of your office and, and ultimately of yourself. How could people get a hold of you if they want to reach you, whether to learn more about your journey, to come and see you as a patient, to maybe if they had a question about you getting into medical school or you said you do some preceptorships yeah. or internships, how would they reach you? Uh, so we have two websites. We have a website for isscolorado.com. Uh, and that's our integrated sports and spine website kind of tells you about our office and the services we provide and the kind of patients we see. And then we also have a doc personal injury for patients that have been injured in a car accident. So patients that have had, sp you know, spine injuries, musculoskeletal injuries, uh, or concussions. Uh, those are, those, those are some of the things that we also treat. And I think, um, we do it really well. Well, reach out if you have a question for Dr. Mike Tracy, reach out to him. They've been great. We use them for uh, people that have been injured here and we get amazing feedback about uh, the care that they give and having gone to their office several times. And again, I sent my son 
there to shadow Dr. Mike to uh, con- when he was considering healthcare as a as a profession. So, Dr. Mike, thank you for the time. Thank Continued you so success to you, and you know that you always have a great support system here at Ramos Law. We just appreciate you. I'd love to come back another time and pick new topics. This was great. Let's do it. Okay. Thanks so much.